Hello and welcome to episode 295 of Stand Up, the daily podcast that brings you the best experts on the most important issues affecting you, your family, your community, your country, and your planet each and every day. My amazing guest for almost an hour today is the author of the new book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. It's Heather McGee. My name is Pete Dominic. Time to stand up with me right now. Hello and welcome to the show. I thank you very much for pressing play on Stand Up, your going to really enjoy and I hope learn a lot from my conversation with author, activist, think tanker, policy expert, Heather McGee, who I met years ago when she was the director of Demos, which is a progressive economic policy think tank. And Heather is absolutely brilliant. This week alone, she was on The Daily Show. She's on CBS with Gail King. She has been touring the country virtually, being interviewed by some of the best and the brightest. Today, it is me, Pete Dominic, talking to Heather McGee about her great new book, which I'm really enjoying. And by the way, I've got three great authors joining me with three great books this week also coming up. Uh, this week, I've got Jonathan Cohn, who is a uh, journalist who has been writing about health care his entire career, one of the best and the brightest. His new book is called The Ten Year War, Obamacare and the Unf- Unfinished Crusade for Universal Health Coverage. Also, climate scientist Dr. Michael Mann will join me this week to talk about his new book, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet. And very excited for all three of these guests on this week's show. It is the final week of February, right? Final full week of February. That means get your seedlings started under lights. If you haven't planted flowers, vegetables, to fruits under lights starting at the beginning of March, Hey, give it some thought. If you're more interested in that, join the Stand Up Garden Club if you're on Facebook. I spent most of the weekend outside in the 20 to 30 degree New York State weather. First, both days, very sunny. Saturday, I was on a snow-covered awning of the shed here where I do the podcast because my neighbor called the town on me and now I have to take an awning down because it's too close to the back of my property and harming nobody, but apparently against the violation, certainly put me in danger. I almost died up there trying to take this shed awning down, but I'm being very positive. I'm going to repurpose the materials and make more garden boxes for my garden this year. Uh, yesterday, cleaned the, the garage all out. Rather, Sunday did that. Felt good about it. And binge-watched Madam Secretary, which is an ABC show with uh, Tim Daly and Taylor Leone. It's been on for like seven seasons. And I always loved Tim Daly. Used to be pretty friendly with him back in the day. And I, I like the show. I can't even believe it. I mean, some of you... I'm watching a network show. I'm so not hip. Also had a great time Friday night. A really good time. We were almost uh, three hours hanging out on Zoom with a whole bunch of subscribers to this podcast. The stand-up community, we like to call it. And... There's, I don't know how many, like 50 people there. We had a great time. And Eric Siegel stopped by. J.L. Covan stopped by. And we had a lot of laughs on Friday night. We usually do it Thursday, and we will this Thursday at 8 p.m. If you're not already subscribing to this podcast, this is a daily podcast. It is free, but it is not cheap, and I can use your support. Sign up now with a paid subscription. Go to the paid subscription link in the show notes or patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Every day I talk to one or two brilliant people here on the podcast, always hearing from you as well. Your feedback is all welcome. You're all producers of the show, standupwithpete at gmail.com. So I always have these great guests, and I pretty much every day do this opening news segment recapping the last couple days, or generally speaking, the last 24. So let's do it, shall we? It seemed over the weekend driving the news cycle was, of course, that we got to this horrible number of almost 500,000 dead Americans. You should see the cover of the New York Times on Sunday where they had a, a tiny little dot graph 
And it was horrific to see all of the deaths charted out that way. Also, over the weekend, a plane flying from Denver to Honolulu had to turn around and come back when its engine fell off and landed on homes. Miraculously, no one was uh, harmed or injured on the plane or on the ground. The plane turned around and landed safely, and everybody applauded. That could have been a horrible disaster over the weekend. Uh, And as a result, I think uh, the Japanese uh, grounded their fleet of, I think it's a 777, but don't quote me on that one. And also on the weekend, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and other Democratic women in uh, in Congress uh, raised five million dollars for Texans suffering in the deep freeze uh, that they've seen over the last week. And then AOC flies down to Houston and was joined with other congresswomen, as I said, And uh, she and other lawmakers, Democrats, visited food distribution centers, water delivery sites, toured the damage left behind from the unprecedented storm. Here she is. When disaster strikes, this is not just an issue for Texans. This is an issue for our entire country. And our whole country needs to come and rally together behind the needs of Texans all across the state. And, you know, as was mentioned earlier, disasters don't strike everyone equally. When you already have so many families in the state and across the country that are on the brink that can't even afford an emergency to begin with, when you have a disaster like this, it can just set people back for years, not just for days. And so we have tragedy in this state. We need to rally around the state. We need to rally federal support for Texans and the state of Texas. And we need to make sure that we make short and long-term policy decisions so that this kind of devastation, preventable devastation, never happens again. And, of course, AOC's efforts come as Texas Senator disgraced Senator Ted Cruz her political adversary, they go at it on Twitter, is facing a pretty, pretty bad backlash, including from members of his own party for flying to Cancun, Mexico. Well, Ted Cruz, for his part, uh, he put on his dad outfit, his dumb fleece and jeans and sneakers and his stupid face. And he went out and he had a team of photographers uh, taking pictures of him put in a case of bottled water in somebody's trunk. In an empty parking lot, and he got lambasted on Twitter, and it's really funny, and I wanted to share just a couple of the tweets. David Weissman writes, first you abandon your constituents, now they are crisis photo ops to you? Do you have any shame at all at Ted Cruz? Carolyn Schultz writes, only you would tweet photos that look like you're stealing water, you utterly useless dipshit. Are you there to unload the supplies that AOC and Beto O'Rourke gathered? At Melissa Ryan on Twitter, I'm glad someone in Ted Cruz's Senate office finally instructed him how to fake compassion and humanity and creating the illusion that he cares about the people he was elected to serve. At Schneider underscore CM tweets, I guess this photo op is for all the people who joined Twitter today, which was a very funny one. And finally, at Brian Tyler Cohen writes, at AOC has used her social media to raise more than $4 million, $5 million now, for the people of Texas. Ted Cruz used his to share a photo op of him placing a single case of water into a car. All right. Well, that's the reaction to that. That was a, a lot of hubbub over the weekend, of course. Also, I just want to mention here that we have reached uh, half a million deaths as a result of coronavirus in the United States of America. And on Meet the Press, Chuck Todd asked Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, about that horrific milestone. Here's that moment. Uh, It's stunning, uh, Chuck. Horrible. I mean, if you look at what's what's has gone on now and we're still not out of it. A half a million deaths. Uh, it's just, it's, it's terrible. It is historic. We haven't seen anything even close to this for well over a hundred years since the 1918 pandemic of influenza. It, it's something that is stunning when you look at the numbers. Almost unbelievable, but it's true. It, this is a devastating pandemic, and it's historic. People will be talking about this decades and decades and decades from now. All right, I'll come back to Dr. Anthony Fauci in uh, talking about teachers and schools and when we can get students back in the classrooms, but staying with the uh, the larger picture, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, former FDA chief, uh, was on CBS Face Nation with Margaret Brennan, and she asked him, where are we and is there a reason to be optimistic? Here's Dr. Gottlieb. 
Look, this has taken a tragic toll on the United States, but we should be optimistic, in my view. I think we're going to continue to see infection rates decline into the spring and the summer. Um, right now, they're falling quite dramatically. I think these trends are likely to continue. The new variants do create new risk. I think B117 creates some risk that we could see a resurgence of infection in certain parts of the country and higher prevalence overall in the spring and the summer than we might have seen without this strain. But it's not going to be enough to reverse these trends at this point. I think it's too little too late in most parts of the country um, with rising vaccination rates and also the fact that we've infected about a third of the public, that's enough protective immunity that we're likely to see these trends continue. The risk is really to the fall. And one last point, if you look at the counties in New York and New Jersey that had greater than 45 percent seroprevalence, meaning that 40, more than 45 percent of the population was infected going into the winter, they really didn't have much of a winter surge. So once you get to about 40 percent of the population with some form of protective immunity, you don't have herd immunity, meaning that this mm -hmm. won't transfer at all. It will continue to transfer, but it will transfer to much slower rate and that's what we have right now around the country all right a lot of information packed into that sound by by uh, dr scott godlieb on cbs's face the nation i watched or listened to all i listened to all of the shows in like speed and a half while i was cleaning the garage all the sunday shows the best one by far in my opinion is velshi which is two hours saturday and Sunday morning. But the other big controversy that we're hearing a lot about is about schools and teachers and when should students be able to go back. And there's a lot of demonizing the teachers and the teachers unions. And I've had enough of that. This is a super complicated issue. There are 7,000 school districts in this country. They all require different resources and have different resources. And here's the thing. Many things can be true at once. That's one of the most important phrases or thoughts that I've learned in thinking about these difficult issues that we talk about here with each other all the time. You don't need to pick sides against teachers and their unions. It's very complicated. There are thousands of districts. Teachers are, of course, also often parents. And they want to be in the classroom. Virtual teaching is hard. It can be humiliating and exhausting, of course, for everybody. And they know that the students aren't learning as well. In most cases, and even I am now generalizing, but the disrespect, the generalizations and threats to teachers is beyond effed up, in my opinion. Walk a day in their shoes before you start criticizing them. This is tough for everybody. And it's getting a lot of conversation on the Sunday shows, including from Dr. Anthony Fauci and Chris Christie, who hates teachers unions, as well as others. And I want to play a couple of those clips for you. But let's start with the question being asked on Meet the Press by Chuck Todd, who is trending because everybody can't stand his guest selection and his inability to push back, as well as his constant false equivalencies, but because they are NBC and meet the press and have millions of viewers, they get the big guests. And Chuck Todd asks the obvious questions in this case to Anthony Fauci about teachers and classrooms. Based on the CDC guidelines, what level of risk is an unvaccinated teacher taking uh, right now? by going uh, into a reopened school? You know, Chuck, you cannot give a, a numerical figure to that. You can't say what is the ri what is the, the risk. Give me a number. I mean, obviously, being in school is very similar to being in the community. So the risk of a, of a, of a teacher getting infected in the school is very likely very much similar to what you would see in the community. But we don't know that yet. You see, they haven't done those kind of prospective studies where you can quantitate and make a decision based on this number is here and that number is there because the data get fuzzy when you try to compare what happens when you're not in the school versus when you are in the school. See, Dr. Anthony Fauci says the data gets fuzzy. It's There's a lot of gray area here, but Meet the Press's Chuck Todd tries to pin Dr. Anthony Fauci down on this question. Here's more. Would you feel comfortable going into a classroom and teaching? Um... Would I feel comfortable? Um, you know, it's tough because I've not been in that situation. I could tell you I have a daughter who I adore who is actually doing just that right now as we speak in a city far from Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I understand the concern that people have. And that's the reason why we say, Chuck, you know, when you ask a question, a specific question, it's appropriate and it's understandable. But there are so many complicated issues, how the teachers feel 
how the parents feel about the possibility of bringing infection back home. There are so many things there that you need to consider. The thing that we say, and Chuck, I've been saying this for months and months, even anti-dating the CDC guidelines, is that the default position is that we should try to do everything we can to get the children back to school safely for the children and safely for the teachers and other educational personnel. Yeah. And the CDC guidelines try to delineate the steps where you can do just that. How do we get them back to school in a safe way and giving a couple of the guidelines, more than a couple, right. several of the guidelines of how you can do that. And it's not an easy, it's not an easy issue, Chuck. Anybody that says it's easy decision to make, yeah. they're not looking at the complexity of it. Well, don't tell that to the no longer in office, Chris Christie, and for good reason, everybody hated him, because he has for a long time made an enemy of teachers and teachers unions with his horrific rhetoric about them, and he made no exception, of course, on ABC's This Week. Here he is, trying to simplify the issue in a way that it's so easy to, to create hatred and demonization of teachers, educators, for God's sake. So all we heard was follow the science, right, from right. Joe Biden. Absolutely follow the science. The science tells us in the Journal of the American Medical Association that children and staff are less likely to be infected with COVID in the classroom than they are in their community by eightfold. Okay. So the science says get kids back in the classroom. The science says that our children have a higher suicide rate now. They have higher other mental health problems and drug abuse. The science tells us kids need to get out of home and get back into the classroom. And that's what Joe Biden was saying until Randy Weingarten and the AFT said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Well, he's then still the, saying he wants the majority of schools open well, here, but, right? Yeah, he's saying it, but he's not. But he has a CDC person do the backflip of the century. Um, within 17 days, she went from... The Science tells us the schools are ready to be open. Parents, let me tell you, and now the politics of this, John, this is a problem for, for Vice President or for President Biden. He's got the teachers union who has been a huge supporter of his and who expect him to be loyal. On the flip side, he won this election with suburban white educated voters who, when they see this science, they're already mad that their kids are not back at school. They're going to yeah. be even angrier. And this well, is clearly the issue. The Repo- but we need to be patient with each other. This is the issue because politically that's the issue. That's the way that you want to paint it, Chris Christie. But we need to work together in our community with each other, with the teachers, with the schools. Come on. That's ridiculous to make it such a divisive binary thing like that. It is not that easy. Over on back on Meet the Press, uh, Chuck Todd had Randy Weingartner on. She's the president of the American Federation of Teachers. She's been on this podcast. She's been on my old show. I know her and I've spent plenty of time with her. She's a super inspiring, amazing leader. One of the most inspiring people I've ever shared space and breath with. Breath? Air with. Anyway, here she is on Meet the Press. I do actually want to debunk this myth that um, teacher unions, at least our union, um, uh, doesn't want to reopen schools. We, teachers know that in-person education is really important. And it's, you know, we would have said that pre-pandemic. We knew that remote education, you know, is not a good substitute. Um, there's a roadmap now. And so you actually can follow that roadmap in terms of defining those risks. And I think between the CDC guidance, as well as the resources that um, President Biden is trying to get in the $1.9 trillion package, um, we have the highway or the roadmap that um, allows us to, to do this. And it comes down to three things, the mitigation, the layered mitigation strategies, the testing so that you can actually see asymptomatic spread and vaccine prioritization. Not that every single teacher has to be vaccinated before you open any schools, but you should align the vaccine prioritization with the reopening of schools. Okay, so I just wanted to do this whole little segment and give you some sound bites on the whole school thing and and, and ask that you ask your friends and make your social media posts nuanced about schools and teachers and teachers unions and not blaming uh, one side or another here in this situation that is so difficult for so many people. My mom, of course, was a public school teacher in the Syracuse City School District for a long time, and I'm so proud of her, and I saw how hard it was. 
And I'm a big, big supporter of teachers and teachers unions. And so we need to understand, of course, as I've said it already, they are parents so often as well. And and uh, and be patient and work with them, not against them. OK, so let me. Finally, share one more clip with you uh, from Ali Velshi. I mentioned earlier that his is the best Sunday and Saturday show, two hours each day. And he's on the road for he's always on the road, Ali Velshi. And he is celebrating Black History Month. He's been doing some great segments and he and his team have booked excellent, excellent guests for the show. But his commentary has become more opinionated, and I love it, for one. I think he's a super nuanced, sharp guy, and he took a moment or a segment on his Saturday morning show to talk about the New York Times reporting that uh, during the Trump administration, promotions for female generals were delayed because uh, the leaders were concerned about Trump's reaction well, Ali Velshi took that reporting and and shared it with his viewers on Velshi and MSNBC and then gave a little bit of his lacing commentary. And I just I'm, well, here it is. In the next few weeks, Biden, uh, President Biden's defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, is expected to send the delayed recommendations to the White House. The New York Times says the Biden administration is expected to endorse the promotions. So General Van Ovost and Lieutenant General Richardson, in the end, will likely get the promotions they deserve. It's just a shame these American heroes were held back because of a misogynist who called our war dead losers and suckers. A rich daddy's boy who skipped out on military service by saying that his feet hurt. (laughs) Velchi, I like it. (laughs) That was real good stuff. All right, well... There you go. That is the last 24. And now a little bit more rapid fire segment, which is something I do around this time, about 20 minutes in uh, to the podcast or so. And it's not politics. It's not COVID. It's the news dump. And today's news dump jingle comes from Pete Coe and his son. A little long, but I like it. Yeah, Pete Coe and Son with the toilet flushing <laughs> and everything. Thanks, Pete. If you want to write a news dump jingle, whether just write it and record it, write it, someone else will record it, by all means, uh, they're, they're, you're welcome to do it. Thank you. All right, let me start in Missouri, where there was a pretty horrifying shooting. One dead, four injured in a shooting at an American Legion in Missouri. KAITV in Missouri reports that officers found the five victims at the American Legion building in Kennett following the report of the shooting before 12.30 a.m. Sunday. Not much reporting other than that, just that there was a a bad, a a pretty terrible shooting. Oh, wait, here's another shooting. Three people are dead and another two injured after a shooting inside a gun store in Louisiana. A deadly shootout occurred just before 3 p.m. local time Saturday at the Jefferson Gun Outlet in Materi, located in the New Orleans metropolitan area. One suspect shot and killed two victims in the store. According to the uh, Jefferson Parish Sheriff, multiple people then opened fire on the suspect, either in the store or the parking lot, killing the suspect. It seems like a terrible place to get involved in a shooting at the Jefferson gun outlet. But I don't know. I don't go to I don't really go to gun stores. But when I do, I stay out of arguments. It's horrible. I think the most horrible story I've heard coming out of the horror in Texas is about the 11 year old boy who died. He froze to death. His name is Christian Pavan and his family now is uh, is suing Aircott Entergy for a one hundred million dollars. The lawsuit alleges gross negligence by the power grid operator and the electricity provider saying it led to the death of this young boy. The boy died Tuesday after spending the night in his frigid mobile home that lost power. Such a sad story in such a rich country. But how about this story from the Associated Press? Scientists have cloned the first U.S. endangered species, a black-footed 
ferret duplicated from the genes of an animal that died over 30 years ago. Some Jurassic Park at ferret stuff here. The slinky predator named Elizabeth Ann, born December 10th and announced Thursday, is cute as a button. But watch out, unlike the domestic ferret foster mom or character in the world, she's wild at heart, according to uh, the Associated Press. The first clone of a U.S. endangered species. That's good news, right? That's good news. This was an interesting story trending on Sunday night. Family members of Malcolm X say they have new evidence that shows that the NYPD and FBI conspired in the murder of killing Malcolm X, the civil rights activist, one-time Nation of Islam spokesman. The Guardian is reporting this during a Saturday news conference at the site of the Audubon Ballroom where Malcolm X was assassinated on February 22nd, 19, 21st, 1965. Three of Malcolm X's daughter revealed a deathbed letter attributed to Raymond Wood, former undercover NYPD officer. In the letter, Wood said that he was pressured to encourage members of Malcolm X's security detail to commit crimes, which led to their arrests days before the assassination. The result was that there wasn't door security at the ballroom. And uh, the letter uh, alleges a lot more than that. But this is the news dump. Look it up if you'd like. Donald Trump reporting to the spotlight when he's going to be a speaker at a CPAC in Florida. Oh, wait, we're not talking about Donald Trump or doing politics. This is the news dump. I don't know how that story slipped through. I ba- blame my new produce- producer, Keith. Hey, no politics, no Trump in the news dump. Okay, Mr. Pete. Calls me Mr. Pete. He's so cute. A zookeeper in northwestern Germany was attacked Sunday by a lion as she cleaned its cage, authorities say. Uh, The 25-year-old employee of the Osnabrück Zoo was not considered seriously injured, but was hospitalized as a precaution. Uh, Still no word on why the lion attacked the woman, but uh, experts are saying because it's a lion. (laughs) Old Norm MacDonald weekend update style, Jeff. And what do you think of this story? A 95-year-old Tennessee man who was a Nazi guard has been deported to Germany. His name was Friedrich Karl Berger, or is, he's still alive. He was the 70th Nazi removed from the U.S., and uh, he was sent back to Germany for his role in the Holocaust, according to the Justice Department. Apparently, he was an armed guard at the Nuchenkeim concentration camp system in Germany, where he participated in Nazi, quote, Nazi-sponsored acts of prosecution. I don't know, he's 95 been here forever. Well, what was he going to do in Germany? Um, I don't know. The exact date of his deportation was not a, uh, deportation was not immediately clear, apparently. But it's always a weird situation. But that is your news dump for Monday. All right, let me get to my first guest, shall we? She is the former president of the progressive think tank Demos, where she spent much of her career. Where I first, uh, where she was when I first met her. She's got a bachelor's degree in American studies from Yale, a law degree from the University of California, Berkeley. She uh, currently is the chair of the board of the uh, organization Color of Change, a nationwide online racial justice organization. But her new book is absolutely integral to you to, for you to read and buy The Some of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. I love this conversation with Heather McGee. We talked for almost an hour and uh, here we go for the work that you've done and the work in your career and policy and now the work that you did to research this book. It doesn't I don't think anybody would describe it as, as glamorous. But this week you're talking to or I've talked to Elizabeth Warren, John Legend, Adam Serwer, Ibram Kendi, Alex Wagner. You were on The Daily Show. You were on with Gail King. It's a, it's a glamorous week for Heather McKee's new book. And now joining Pete Dominic, it's a, it must be a huge honor. It's the capstone. It's the capstone of the week. <laughs> I haven't left sweatpants the entire time, though. That's the thing about the virtual media tour. So, Well, and nobody needs to, to change their pants to buy this book and read it at home. Go get it right now. The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. Congratulations. I feel the need for this book. For the way okay. that you wrote it and the way that you researched it. But what did you see when you thought of, yeah, I, well, I need to write this book. Your career was changing away from policy. I think it was sparked around the, the idea around the time of, of the, the great Donald Trump being elected to run our country. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I had worked for nearly 20 years um, helping to build and then running a think tank that researched and designed solutions to economic inequality. And it just felt like we were sort of hitting our heads against a wall. In particular, obviously, you know, the majority of white people voting for Donald Trump was, you know, a wake up call for, for so many people. But for me, I felt like I needed new tools beyond just economic policy research and bringing them to Washington and asking people to do what was in the country's economic interest, because there was some other story. And it wasn't just the dollars and cents and the facts and figures. It was some deeper story that was sort of compelling people to vote the way they did and compelling lawmakers to continue to sort of shortchange our country and sabotage our economic interests. And so I went on this journey. And the question guiding the journey was, why can't we have nice things? You know, and by nice Who's things, we? Yeah, well, the, this is important, right? The we was all Americans. It was white Americans who are the largest group of the impoverished and the uninsured. And of course, it's also people of color who are disproportionately so. And the nice things is not like laundry that does itself and, you know, flying cars, although both of those things would be really great. Um, you know, the nice things are universal health care, child care, a reliable infrastructure, a public health system to handle pandemics. The things that other countries with a fraction of our wealth, but as that are as developed, have managed to figure out. And frankly, the things that we were sort of on a path to figure out um, in the middle of the century when we were building things and investing in America and sending generations to college for free and had good union jobs. And we walked away from that formula. And what became clear to me was that racism was the missing part of the story of why we lost our way in this country. Yeah. You talk about other countries and, and why we can't have good things. And, and this leads me to a question I really wanted to ask your, your take on, which is, can you have a successful, prosperous, multicultural democracy? Because you're talking about Denmark, the UK, yeah. you're talking about Japan, you're talking about mm -hmm. Israel and Australia in terms of education and health care and certain economic uh, opportunities, especially as you talk a lot about organized labor and the role it feels like the reason we can't have nice things, and this is what you, you, you talk about, is because at some point we didn't want nice things for other Americans. Mm -hmm. You know what Americans were talking about. Like, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of them, but we whites wanted to keep uh, most of the good stuff for us and we can have a democracy for us and and everybody else, you know, whatever, whatever is left behind. Well, I think it's got to be possible. I mean, to be honest, you know, Canada is a multiracial democracy that has made being a multiracial democracy, welcoming immigrants and refugees, welcoming, you know, self-emancipated enslaved people when we were still, um, you know, keeping people in slavery. Um, and, you know, they've got universal health care. They're pretty high functioning democracies. So it's totally possible. Right. I mean, this is what is actually makes me hopeful in the course of writing this book, which definitely brought me, you know, face to face with some of the ugliest racism, interpersonal systemic racism. And yet the core of the racist story in the United States is this zero sum racial story. The idea that progress for people of color has to come at the expense of white people. And the social science research shows that that's now a sort of prevalent view among white people. I went to look back at sort of where it came from. I wanted to not take it for granted that that white people would feel that way. People of color don't think that progress for us has to come at the expense of white people. We have more of a sort of win-win worldview. And so it was clear that this was actually a story that had been sold. You know, it had been created at the beginning of our country to justify stolen people, stolen land and stolen labor. But then it's been revived generation after generation, sort of pitting white Americans against their fellow Americans who are often in the same you know, class position. And then in the past 10 years with Fox News and Rush Limbaugh and, you know, obviously Donald Trump. It's just been like the megaphone story. Fear people of color, hate and distrust the government, turn towards the market and the one percent like that has been the formula. Does is it true that every dollar you make on the sum of us is a dollar out of Tim Wise and Jonathan Metzl's pocket? Is that <laughs> <laughs> do you like my choices? Do you like my two choices? I love those guys and, and all of their work. Um, for this book, 
for this book, you did something really interesting where uh, you, you travel around and talk to people and went to some really interesting parts of the country. And then you read a lot of history, including like you read a book written by a super racist historian. Uh, Rowan, I believe, is his name. Yeah, and I think Rowan Helper. You Hinton Rowan Helper, yeah. which is the name of my band, ironically. <laughs> um, what did you learn from who is this guy? Why did you read his book and what did you learn? It's such an important thing. Yeah. So Hinton Rowan Helper wrote a book in, I believe, 1857, if I'm not mistaken. It no, was that, right. you're right. I just read that line in your book. It was 18. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yep. Yep. During um, uh, before the Civil and War. And he was a white Southerner, uh, you know, during the era of slavery and the, the build up to the Civil War, who wrote this very influential kind of pamphlet where he went to all of the states and counted the number of public institutions that each state had. He also counted, you know, he did like this major accounting of sort of the relative richness of the southern states versus the northern free states. And what he found, and this was the argument that he was making, was that slavery was impoverishing the South. And the part of it that I thought was so interesting was that he really put the focus on the public institutions, the 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 libraries, the, the schools, and found that even though the sl slave states were often more populous, they had far fewer schools and libraries and pieces of public infrastructure. And that was basically because the plantation class, which was running everything, even though it was a minority of the white population, didn't need to give the white people any schools, right? It, it certainly, it was elite. They made it illegal to educate black people and they didn't need any educated white people. They didn't need libraries and, you know, well-paved roads and all of these things because they had this contained system. And so this sort of idea of like plantation politics where the wealthy don't need the rest of the country and the rest of the community um, was how he made the case that slavery was in um, was not in the self-interest of white Southerners who did not own slaves. It's such an important point, and we still see so many of these policies that are passed today, and we can argue, we can talk about how they were written, designed, uh, who benefits and who loses, but it really is so much more often about class than it is race, and yet white people are constantly voting against their own self-interest. You cite many of these policies, and we can talk about uh, the collapse of the economy in 2008 and housing and, and, and what happened there. We can obviously talk about Obamacare, which white people overwhelmingly hated Obamacare because of the Obama part and yet would have benefited from it more than black folks. It, you could, you yeah. could make the argument in, in that yeah. case. Pick any of these policies and help me understand how they actually worked at a detriment of white people, but we love supporting them. Yeah. So, I mean, this this was really helpful and eye opening for me. I looked back at, you know, sort of the like gold standard public opinion data that, you know, tracks over the last 70 years. And it turns out that before the civil rights movement sort of burst into the white consciousness in the mid 1960s, early 1960s, um, Two thirds of white people thought that the government ought to guarantee a job to anyone who wanted one and guarantee a high minimum income to anyone, everyone in the country. Right? This is like bananas, radical left wing ideas now, a job guarantee and a universal basic income. And then that was in 1960. It was almost 70 percent support among white Americans. And then in 1964, I'm like scanning the spreadsheet. It goes down to 35 percent. The support drops in half. It becomes this you know, minority idea among white Americans. And I was like, OK, maybe there's a problem with the spreadsheet. No, the, the support stayed low to this day, which we know. Right. So what happened between 1960 and 1964, Pete, right? Um, 1963, Kennedy starts speaking out forcefully on civil rights. 1963, the March on Washington was for jobs and freedom and included these two economic demands as part of their platform. And it became clear that government, which at that point had been showering free stuff on white Americans from the Homestead Act to the GI Bill, to the subsidized uh, suburbs, to the housing um, backstops and subsidies, to the mortgage uh, um, you know, finance that was exclusive, all of it exclusive for white people and excluding black people, suddenly became clear to the white majority that 
Democrats were planning to extend these benefits, these public benefits across the racial line. And so they said, no, thank you. The cover of my book, the story at the heart of the book is the story of when the towns across the country drained their public swimming pools that were funded by tax dollars that were these sort of beautiful grand resort style swimming pools there was sort of this like very concrete symbol of government largesse and government commitment to a high quality of life this sort of american dream in the public sphere yeah joe biden our president was a lifeguard at a pool like there that. you go But so many towns, and not just in the South, drained their public pools because they were segregated. And once the civil rights movement allowed black families to say, hey, that's our tax dollars, too. We want our kids to swim. They drained them instead. They filled them with dirt. And therefore, white families lost a public resource as well. The rich families that could build a backyard pool were fine or that, you know, we have these like members only swim clubs cropping up all over the country. But it was the pulling away from the public. And that to me has in many ways been the story of politics and our economy over the last 60 years. Yes. So well said the story of politics, because the word public, that word has taken a Beating that I feel like the word public now means black to a lot. Yeah. Of people. Yeah. Black and brown. Yeah. You hear public right. access, public transportation, mm-hmm. public, public uh, housing, public housing. Of course, uh, people think of brown and black and then they they automatically put that in a category of not necessarily benefiting them, which is the huge problem for white people. That's what you're making the point here. You're like, we, we all lose we yeah. all lose. We're not. You know, it's very few people yeah. win. Let, t- let's talk about how healthcare relates to that. I mean, yeah. when you see the, the pandemic disproportionately affecting black and brown people, but it's so easy for white people to say the reason why black folks don't do as well is because they don't try is hard. The reason why black people are getting sick is because they're not taking as good care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a story that we tell ourselves for any number of psychological reasons, uh, but it is a story that is destroying all of us every day. Uh, Help me understand the healthcare story. That's right. I mean, the pandemic, you know, obviously, you know, began sort of as I was winding down writing the book, but in many ways there's, there's no more life and death current example of it than this. Um, You know, this virus is a colorblind virus. And yet, you know, when the disparities first became came clear, that was when you saw Trump and the Republicans say, oh, well, you know, we don't need to worry about this as much. This is this fits into our hierarchy of human value that we have. The super mensch like me, Donald Trump, who gets to get sick and get experimental drugs on the taxpayer's dime are going to be fine. But Herman Cain is going to die, you know. Um, right. So it's like that's that's the, the world view. Um, this sort of survival of the fittest kind of social Darwinism thing mapped onto skin color. But why is it that black, brown and indigenous people are getting sicker and dying more? First of all, because we are more likely to be essential workers, Uh, these essential workers who are not treated as essential by, you know, the meatpacking plants that, you know, pack people in without PPE and the Amazon warehouses and the nursing homes and the home care, right? All of these jobs that are essential to the economy that are usually underpaid without health care benefits and can't be done from home are leaving brown and black people more exposed. People have less affordable housing. They can't socially distance. They can't work from home. They can't, um, you know, choose not to go to work because they have to pay the bills. Um, and then you have a, a health care system where it's been proven time and time again that there is so much unconscious racial bias that black, that White medical students believe that black people feel less pain, like there's something physically on our skin because it's darker that makes us feel less pain. You know, all of these stereotypes and racial bias that is sort of compounding the the cost to our to our very bodies and our very health. And it, and it is a tragedy of epic proportions going on in Indian country and in immigrant communities and in black communities. But because our nation so drained the public pool of healthcare resources, of a public health system, of a sense of common good and sort of respect of science, 
we are having the single worst pandemic response of any developed nation. And many non-developed nations are doing better than us. And so nobody is safe and nobody has gone untouched in their lives in some way or another from us dragging on this you know, pandemic and the economic calamity that has res- has fallen um, because of it. The other thing about healthcare, Pete, is like, why do we not have universal health care? Why are we the only advanced country that can't seem to get it together to just make sure that something that's going to happen to everybody, which is you get sick and you have to see a doctor or you like have a baby or, you know, um, and you have to see a doctor. You know, why do we make that something that could bankrupt people? And I go through the history in the book of the fights to try to get a national health insurance program from President Truman. And it was always racism. It was the Dixiecrats in the Democratic Party that turned their back on Truman when he said, we want to have universal health care. They said, no way, not not in our society. Um, And then, you know, Obamacare, which is a pretty modest you know, plan, the Affordable Care Act, has never been popular with the majority of white Americans. The majority of white Americans oppose something that's like pre-existing condition coverage and your kids get to stay on until you're 26 and, you know, you get a subsidy if you're middle class. I mean, it's just so racialized. And I want to just say, you know, today we're supposed to be beyond this kind of like old fashioned, I'm going to drain the pool. I'm going to have a whites only sign racism. And yet racism has evolved. It's no longer white people who think, you know, there's something physically, you know, inferior about black people, though. It's interesting. The coronavirus pandemic stuff has really, you know, brought that back, but is black people don't try hard enough. As you said, Um, You know, black people take more than they give. They're the takers and we're the makers. They're the freeloaders and we're the taxpayers. And that is not true. And I don't even want to have to like sit here and explain why it is that black people put far more effort into an economy that gives so little back to us. But it's also something as do immigrants. Yeah, as do immigrants. Exactly. But it's something that makes all people who struggle in the eyes of the white majority, including white people who struggle, it makes them disrespect their own value. Do you know what I mean? Like I talked to this woman, Bridget, who um, was a fast food worker in Kansas city. And she, you know, the, the idea of the five for 15 started to like, you know, come into the town. And she was like, there's no way that they're ever going to pay people like me $15 an hour. She had worked in the same company for 10 years and had never had a raise because we keep not raising the minimum wage, right? And it wasn't until she went to the first organizing meeting and heard a Latina woman stand up and talk about her life and working so hard and having three kids and feeling like she was trapped in her life that she said, I saw myself in her for the first time. And I had always believed this us versus them stuff. I'd always believed the immigrants were coming to take our jobs and it was the you know blacks that were holding us back. But it was through organizing that she gained a sense of solidarity, that she was like, you know what, I'm going to fight for this woman. I'm going to fight for her family and fight for mine. And she's going to fight for mine. And it raised her like horizon for what she thought was possible for herself because she wasn't denigrating other people who struggle. Well, you mentioned organizing. You write a lot about this in the book about the degradation of unions and organized labor. And we can again go back to Europe and and so many other countries and look at how strong it still is. But I always think about, I guess, 2012. I was on set at CNN and I asked John King, who's a pretty sharp political analyst. I said, why are white? We just did a segment. I said, why are white union members voting for Mitt Romney? What? Why would they do that? They Republicans and Mitt Romney want to destroy unions, destroy everything that they have gained in their jobs and the success and the comfort. And I'll never get John King just stopped and looked at me and said, because Barack Obama's black. And I kind of was like, why don't you say that on set? But regardless, I don't think I've ever shared that on the record. I've talked about that happening, but I've never name called John King. But um, the the point is, and you talk about this in the book, it's crazy. And I have an anecdote from my own life. My wife's father, who we're not tight with, doesn't surprisingly listen to the podcast. Still lives in Detroit, uh, immigrant from Italy, worked on the line, Heather, at Ford. Yeah. Um, UAW member. 
tells me every time I've seen him, which is only a few times in my life, and he'll say a black guy got promoted over him at Ford on the line. Again, union member, racist because of that. Doesn't yeah. even know what he's thinking, but there's so much of that within organized labor, and that's such a key story in, in, in your book into economic policy in America in general. Help me yeah, understand it. That's exactly right, Pete. So, I mean, you know, the, the size of the middle class and the what the middle class is able to take home from the national income has shrunk in step as the size of union you know, power has diminished, as the share of workers in the union has diminished. And so, you know, and as I'm going around the country trying to sort of re- reconsider the story of how we lost the middle class in this country, you got to tell the story of unions. And you really can't actually tell an accurate story about collective bargaining, about the idea of workers joining together in solidarity without talking about race, right? We're talking about people linking arms and do they do that across lines of race? The divide and conquer has been the tool of the boss that has been the most powerful throughout our history, this idea of job competition. So in the beginning of formal labor, organizing in America, um, you had this really radical group called the Knights of Labor that said explicitly, they said, why we have to have everybody in. We can't discriminate against black people because then the boss will just use them to, to strike break. Right. The bo- if you're if you have this whole ready labor pool outside that could be substituted for a whites only union, the boss has got all the leverage to say, go ahead, ask for more and we'll just fire you and hire the black people. Right. Which was always kind of the threat. The Knights of Labor because it's for about 10 years and then they fell apart. And the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, came in and allowed discrimination in unions. And so for the first part of, you know, the 20th century, black people were sort of synonymous with strike breakers because the boss would bring in black people to break the strikes because the white people wouldn't let the black people in the union, you know, wouldn't let them on the shop floor. And so it wasn't until there was more cross racial factory work that you started to see that sort of golden era of union organizing, you know, like in Detroit. But today, as the civil rights movement allowed for more gains, as more and more black and brown people um, came into unions in the 50s and 60s, you started to see white people politically turning their back on the union. I went down to Mississippi where the UAW, exactly your, your father-in-law's union, was trying to organize a plant in the South, right? Because we know that you know Nissan and Toyota and Hyundai and all of them have located in the South for non-union work, lower wages, crappy health care, 401ks instead of pension. Right to work for less states right to work for less states you know undercutting detroit and the gains there and i talked to workers who said you know we lost the union drive because the white workers think if the blacks are for it then i'm against it and that was just basically it it's that zero sum and of course that meant none of the workers at the plant got higher wages and benefits and the ability to bargain for better safety Um, but it was true that the jobs got easier as the jobs got whiter, right? There were, it, it was true that there still was an advantage to being white in the plant, in that plant um, in Mississippi, but it, nobody had good health care, right? Nobody was making enough money, um, but you, that's the thing. That's what Du Bois called the, the wages of whiteness. You give white people a little bit of material advantage and benefit, and they're willing to trade up the whole you know, the whole store. Um, LBJ said, you, you know, you make the lowest man, white man think he's better than the highest colored man and you can pick his pocket. And, you know, that's sort of been the story. Yeah, it's so good that you cite both of them because th- those are so accurate. And by the way, I have no data for this, but it's always like the white guy who says he got passed over for a job uh, because of affirmative action. They gave this black guy. He's not as good as me, but they wanted to do this, you know, racial hiring thing. I always want to say to them, like, you know what? Um, You're probably because you're the guy who got passed over. It probably simply means you're the worst white guy. Also, (laughs) like maybe you should think about why they picked you and not Bruce down the line. There, (laughs) I'm just saying. Um, These are still all white. So they they were able to find a whole bunch of white guys (laughs) who, who could get promoted. So you have this statistic in in your book that is so profoundly disturbing, and I want to connect it with another one. But the the, the statistic I'm talking about is the outcomes for 
um, black folks with college degrees versus white dropouts. And I want to connect that, if you can, this might be challenging, to a statistic I've heard many times and most recently even that I'm sure you've heard it a lot, too. It's unbelievably disturbing that white people think they are discriminated against and have less opportunity than black people. I'm not sure which white people, if it's Republicans or all white people, but Mm -hmm. we think as whites, the whites, the whites think we have less opportunity and are more discriminated against black people. Yet a statistic like the college degree versus the white trap, like the truth has no bearing on on most on a lot of white people. And I don't know if you can connect those two stats, but it's so important to me. So everything we believe comes from a story we've been told. And so let's I'm going to resurface here. I think what's been the dominant story that's been sold to white people over generations and particularly in recent years is the zero sum story. The story that progress or even the presence of people of color is a threat to white people. Because there's only so much good to go around, right? So if I'm a white person and I see a black president, it looks to me like the black people are obviously doing well enough that they're able to get their guy in the White House, right? I'm not reading the economic data that shows that the unemployment rate is twice as high. Or if I see a newspaper report about that, I think it's because black people are twice as lazy, right? I don't see the stories about how job discrimination, you better not have a black sounding name you know, on your resume, or you better not walk into an interview because even if you don't have a criminal record, a white guy with a criminal record will get a call back faster than a black guy without a criminal record, right? I may not see all of that. I may diminish that idea that there's still that degree of naked discrimination in in the job market. Um, I may not think about the fact that even though we had a black president, 90% of elected officials at the state, local and federal level were white and two thirds were white men, even though they're only a third of the population. So I may not see all of that. And I certainly, my zero sum story doesn't allow for me to believe that. Right. So then what happens is, and this is how I connect it and why I think that my argument in the sum of us about how racism costs everyone does not mean, for example, that we shouldn't have reparations. What it means is that we need the government to invest in all of our people the same way invested so generously back when it was only for white people. So how does that connect to the the racial wealth gap between blacks and whites? The idea that black people have less than a dime in wealth on average than the average white person and That importantly, it doesn't matter what any individual black person does today. They can get all the education, get all the good jobs that they want, and you still have history showing up in your wallet. Because wealth, not your paycheck, but how much your house is worth, how much stock you have in the bank, how much savings you have, that is really about the compounding interest on decisions made long before this new generation of young adults was born. It's about the fact that the federal government explicitly drew lines across the black, around the black neighborhoods in this country and said, banks, you may not lend there because it's too risky. Never substantiating that idea, but just saying black people equals risk. So now that's why you do have a, high, uh, a household that's headed by a black graduate from college has less wealth on average than the household who's headed by a white high school dropout because the white high school dropout you know, had $10,000 in GM stock from his union grandfather when the unions were still exclusive, had, you know, a little money from her, right? Uh, had a little I literally money. had G- I literally got a $1,500 check from my uncle. He goes, thank GM. It was 20 years ago and I used it uh, to whatever. I probably yeah. bought drugs, but uh, I don't know. I, I was trying to think of something funny. I know I used it. I remember I used it so I could go do an internship for free on a film set. And it wasn't that interesting to uh, now talk about. So I just said I bought drugs with it. But the point is, he literally okay. gave me GM stock. And, but, and and what did it allow you to do? What did that wealth allow you to do? It allowed, it allowed me to have a, a very important opportunity in my life for a whole month. Really? This is- <laughs> really? You know, I mean, this is the thing, right? This is how the the racism in wealth building when, you know, the pools were just for white people, still aggregates today. And that doesn't mean we want to take away the GM stock from you. You know, I want you to have that internship, although I think internship should be paid. 
But we want to refill the pool for everyone. And we want to recognize, and this is what I say in the conclusion, that because of how racist our economic policies have been for all of our history, we're not all standing at the same depths in that pool today. So, yes, you know, the folks who are most underwater are going to need more support. And that's okay. It's not a zero sum. When the government cuts a check for reparations, which I think it has to, it's not coming out of white people's pockets. It's coming out of the government, which is the one that did the segregating, did the enslaving, did, um, you know, all of the policies that stripped wealth. And you know what? It's going to be beneficial for our entire economy to allow every black young person to get that kind of seed capital. Um, that we know makes a difference in people's lives. The the easiest reparation to make right now would be to give people of color uh, the vaccine first. Well, that's great, but that just stops us from dying. We also need to live and to thrive. Um, I know, but I'm, I, well, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I'm just I'm saying that because it would be so rejected if it were pitched that way. But it's such the easiest one because not only have they suffered more in general for health outcomes, period, they've suffered more specifically as a result of the pandemic. So it would make more sense because they're more vulnerable because of what you articulated earlier about frontline jobs. But my point is that even if that was proposed, it would be so controversial. But Well, it was proposed. So this was in Dallas. Yes, this was in Dallas. Um, they said, you know what, let's look at these zip codes that have been hardest hit by the pandemic and let's put the county share, which was only like 10% of the vaccines that were available, let's put them in this count, in these um, zip codes. And then another, you know, said, I think it was the county council or the city council said, if you do that in Dallas, we will cut off your vaccine supply period. So nobody gets a vaccine. You heard what, uh, what's his name, DeSantis did in Florida too, right? Like, no, guy's what, such did he, what did that genius do? Uh, he just he was like trying to give uh, vaccines to a wealthy donor friend's community. Oh, yeah. And then oh, yeah. and then it, it came out and he's like, you know what? Nobody gets a vaccine like he is such an unparalleled prick. Um, and, and he's so much worse than a guy like Trump because he went to Harvard. Like he knows how, what he's doing. Um, so, you know, but I think that you can't all these policy ideas that, that you talk about that you've researched and been an expert, become an expert on for, for most of your life. And now you look at this book, which is uh, like a series, I think, of anecdotes and parables and experiences, a journalistic endeavor that you use to illustrate these policies and what effect they've had. But the truth is, in my opinion, you know, we're not going to change white people enough to make a difference for black people's lives in a conversation, in media, or unfortunately, even with your book. And to me, the important, the best thing we can do, and it may not be a policy specifically, the most important thing we can do right now is work on voting and access because then way black people have more of a say in all of the issues that you're talking about in terms of economic policy and so much. And, and right now in 2021, we are working actively to make it harder for black folks to vote. And to me, that's, that's where we always have to start right now. We have to restore the voting rights act. That's the most important policy. Am I missing something? No, you're not. It, it is extremely important and, and it's also, you know, I include a chapter on democracy in my book because, you know, if I think about some, you know, what are some of the nice things that this country can't seem to get it together to have a functioning representative democracy that's not corrupt and that has high levels of voting and where it's easy to vote and where we feel like our representatives are paying attention to what we need, you know, is pretty high up on the list. And so. This voter suppression um, is itself one of those examples of racism costing everyone of, um, you know, when I was at Demos, we had a, a lawsuit that went to the Supreme Court where it was, you know, uh, right wing white secretary of state in Ohio um, taking lists of voters who did not vote in an election and sending them a postcard and saying, you're sure you're still a voter? And if you let the postcard drop in the mail with your like grocery circular, then, you know, <laughs> you didn't get to vote. Yeah. And it's just like, and so, so our lead plaintiff was a white guy, you know, a Navy veteran who was like, what, what, just because I didn't vote in a midterm election. And then in the next one, because my mom was sick, I don't get to vote anymore. I've never moved, you know? So it's this kind of, nonsense that is making our democracy poorer for everyone. But yes, you are right. When black people vote, 
in high numbers, as happened in Georgia, it gives this country a chance, you know? I mean, truly, sending Reverend Warnock and John Ossoff to the Senate, um, you know, in the January special election, you know, it changed the course of history, right? It allowed for us to be able to get this pandemic under control. It allowed for us to be able to do something with government other than give tax handouts to the rich. It allowed for us to address climate change. It allowed for us to do the things that everybody needs. Black and brown people need the most, but everybody needs. Uh, Wrapping up, because I know you have to get to, I don't know, some amazingly oh, high profile. It's Oprah at, Oprah oh, at oh. one, I think. <laughs> two. Oprah at one. Um, uh, you deserve it. And that's what I want to say. I want to, you know, end with this compliment and a question, which is the very first time I ever talked to you, I was like, well, this is a this is a very, very intelligent human being. And then every subsequent time I, I just learned more from you. And then then you're the kind of guest and person I talked to where I would see you on a real time or on any other show. And I'm like, oh, got to watch because this is one of the most uh, intelligent, experienced, mm-hmm. passionate people ever. And then I remember even thinking like when I saw that you got married and had a kid, I was just like so excited for you oh, to have cute. a family and all that. But <laughs> so all of that being said, like I've got you on this pedestal. Um, but my qu- my question, and it's not a uh, criticism here, is is what did you learn? You're so smart. Oh, yeah. you're, you're so well researched yeah. and educated on all of these issues. What did you learn in, in your travels and researching the some of us that you didn't so, already know? First of all, Pete, it's so kind of you to say all those. I'm, I've always been rooting for you as well. I, uh, I love listening to your shows. Um, <laughs> I learned so much that I didn't know. I didn't know a ton of stuff about, you know, the history of this country. I didn't know that we had a cross racial uprising of servants, indentured servants and enslaved people, um, you know, a hundred years before the American revolution that was put down. And when it was put down, the colonial elite um, decided to then say, you know what, white people, you actually get to be a step above the black people. So how about you do that instead of joining arms with them and threatening our entire society, right? It's this thing called Bacon's Rebellion. I learned, I didn't know that white people used to want a guaranteed income and a guaranteed job. I didn't know that. I can't, I mean, it's hard for me to even wrap my mind around it in the politics that I have known since Reagan. Um, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't know that if it were only up to white Americans, we wouldn't do anything to address climate change, that white Americans are more skeptical and doubtful and resistant to change. And it's actually the black and brown people that make up a multiracial coalition that's, you know, seeing the urgency and things. Because there's a lot of stuff I didn't know. I probably learned, you know, a handful of things in every single chapter of this book. And then I also met and talked to extraordinary people, black, white and brown, about you know, the America that they know and that they hope for. Uh, it's such a great book and I hope everybody gets it. Let me ask actually, I just thought of one more question, which okay. is, I got to ask you this question, which is um, white people may have recently learned that white people can be terrorists. <laughs> Black people have known this always oh, yeah. their entire yeah. lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard for white people to see white people as terrorists. How important is it that government and the public recognizes the threat of domestic terrorism that we saw on January 6th? But much more importantly, that we, you and I and others have been uh, covering and watching for our entire lives and careers, but it's yeah. seemingly more people are realizing that white folks can be terrorists. How important is it that we resource that and understand it and, and target it? So white supremacist violence has led to more you know, murders than 9-11 since 9-11. Um, and it, you know, our national security apparatus has identified white supremacist radicalization um, at, you know, in the Obama era and accelerating under Trump as, you know, the most urgent domestic security threat. And yet politics has always suppressed, um, you know, the attention to that issue. Political correctness. Yes, exactly. Political correctness. We don't we don't want to inter- we don't want to interrupt the dominant story, right, of the racial hierarchy. Um, if you are a student of history, you would have seen January 6th coming. Um, I am very worried that we that was the beginning opening salvo of a mass radicalization on the right against our government, our democracy and our country. 
And the one of the pieces of the sort of white zero sum story is the pres presumption of innocence. So, I mean, you know, the organic meals for the quote unquote shaman, I mean, don't get me started that he would take the name of, you know, I just anyway, um, you know, the, the, the white woman who got to go on her retreat from Mexico. The fact that the vast majority of people who stormed the Capitol as a lynch mob looking for people to string up got to walk away and go to TGI Fridays afterwards. We we tortured Osama bin Laden's messenger with like a feeding tube in his ass. Like there are people that were completely innocent of any crime that were have been detained their entire lives because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time in the quote war on terror. Like I could go on forever and ever about the harmless brown people who have been arrested, detained, and yes, tortured. In the meantime, you're listing all these people who uh would Broke into the Capitol beat and stole death, shit. Beat to death a police officer with an American flag. Stole state secrets. You know, and then, of course, the person who egged them on can still run for Congress and we're still paying for his transportation and pension. Uh, all right. Well, I didn't mean to end on that negative note, but I did want to ask you about the white terrorist threat yeah. and how we need to recognize it. Have the some of us go buy it right now. I really appreciate you joining me, Heather. I'm so happy for your success. This book is so good and so important. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. All right. Heather McGee. Follow her on Twitter at H. M. McGee, H. McGee on Twitter and uh, more information on the book. Uh, go get it in the show notes. And that's it for today. I've got two more great authors that are joining me this week. Jonathan Cohn about his book on health care. Dr. Michael Mann about his book on climate change and much, much more. Who would you like me to have on the show? Hope to see you Thursday night at our weekly hangout at eight. If you're not already a subscriber, I cannot do this without your paid subscription. So please sign up now. Pay Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or go to the paid subscription link in the show notes and you can join us 24-7 on the Discord platform. If you're a member, you're never alone. I like to say that at the end of the show and I now can mean it because you can always text somebody on the Discord platform that is part of being a subscriber of this podcast and a member of our awesome community. So there you go. I'm out of time. Got to wrap it up, zip it up, zip it up and post this podcast. Let's take it away, John Carroll. Experiment if you stand up. Stand All right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe. Rise up, show a to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up And now, because you stayed, a nice story from my friend Gary Tuckman, who is a great journalist at CNN. 
Maria Allenbacher is the oldest known person in the state of South Carolina, one of the oldest people in the United States. And on this day, the 111-year-old is getting her second dose of the COVID vaccine. Okay, that's good. Maria Allenbacher, now one of the oldest people in the world to get the vaccination. Did it hurt? No, no. Maria lives with her daughter and son-in-law near the Blue Ridge Mountains. Two of her grandchildren and a great-grandson live nearby. But she was born in Germany and lived there a long time, more than a century to be exact. Incredibly, shortly after her 100th birthday, she moved across the ocean to the United States. Everyone calls her Omi, an affectionate German term for grandma. Omi. It's sunny and beautiful again in South Carolina today. Isn't it so nice to live here? Yes, it's beautiful. Maria is incredibly optimistic. She loves her family, reading, and naps, and has a daily ritual that she's convinced has increased her longevity. Ms. Maria, what is the secret to living to 111 years old? Everything normal. I drink wine, I drink beer, I eat what I like. Maria was a little girl during the First World War and the influenza pandemic, and in her 30s during World War II. She became a widow more than 75 years ago. Her daughter and son-in-law say she's had to be strong. We look forward to seeing her every morning come out cheerful, you know, ready to have breakfast, a couple of cups of coffee, and take on the day. How important was it to you that your mother get these vaccines? Well, I, we kind of felt like it's, it's a civic duty. Everybody has to get this vaccine because if we ever want to get over this, we all have to go and have the vaccine. Maria is well aware she is now a role model. I'm very happy to get a shot. I really feel blessed that I can have her for such a long time, and I hope I have her many more years. How old do you want to be? Like, <laughs> or like Methuselah. <laughs> like Methuselah. Methuselah is a biblical figure who lived to 969 years old. I hope you get there. And I think if anyone can, it would be you. <laughs> the end.